This is an ABC podcast. still feel less than thrilled about the prospect of getting older. Well, the narrative 20 years ago was that old age was a time of decline, that you go through life and you build up skills and abilities, and at some point you just start losing them, and they fall off like stones in the rock of Gibraltar or something. But in fact, that's not borne out by the evidence. Uh, older adults improve in many abilities. Every decade after 60, Daniel Levitin is a neuroscientist, an author, professor emeritus at McGill University in Montreal, and a musician. Sting and Joni Mitchell are just some of the names he's worked with. He's also 62, and his new book, The Changing Mind, looks at the research that shows why the older brain shouldn't be discounted. Hi, I'm Sana Kadar, and you're listening to All in the Mind. Today, how the brain actually improves as we age and how we can help it. It's very easy to feel negative about aging, that it's all just a miserable decline and we become irrelevant in the workplace, etc., etc. But early on in the book, you mentioned that when older people are asked to pinpoint which age they were happiest, they most often select age 82. And I found that really surprising. Why is that the age that people are happiest? Well, it's hard to say. The survey just asked people. Um, It didn't ask them why. But knowing a bit about lifespan psychology, I'm willing to make an informed guess. If you just thought, well, yeah, that's surprising. It surprised me too. Mm. But in thinking about it, I don't think I want to be three years old again where I'm not potty trained yet. (laughs) I don't know anybody who wants to go back to being 16 and 17 years old or 13 for that matter. Most of us found those years stressful. To a large degree in our 20s, many of us are trying to find ourselves, find a job, find a partner. It's a time of uh, discovery and excitement, but not much stability for many of us. And then there's a kind of a dip in happiness that social psychologists describe happening in the late 40s, the so-called midlife crisis, where we realize all those things that I thought I could be when I was 20, they didn't happen. And for, you know, half of the population ends up getting divorced. And most people don't go into a marriage thinking that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So you know, you round 50 and you think, well, you know, things things didn't happen for me the way I thought. But a number of changes occur in the brain starting around age 60, where structural changes, chemical changes cause us to focus on gratitude, uh, to feel empathy and compassion for others. And what Laura Karstensen, psychologist at Stanford, calls a positivity bias, we tend to see the positive in the people and situations around us. Part of that is that our amygdala shrinks, which is the fear center of the brain. And so all these things together kind of converge to make older age people happier. You write about the role personality plays in determining who ages well and who doesn't. So what do we know about the effects of certain personality traits? Well, so personality traits are partly influenced by your genetics. You can have a genetic propensity towards things like being generous or quick to anger or uh, moody or curious. One of the most important traits that we have, an individual difference uh, that varies across all people, is resilience. Some people are simply more resilient than others. And that's part, as I say, it's partly shaped by genetics, but it's also influenced by the experiences you had, the role models you had, whether you saw resilience in people around you, whether you're a member of a culture, either a macro or micro culture, that encourages being resilient, you know, getting up and getting back on the horse and and not letting life defeat you. It's related to whether you have what we call an internal or external locus of control. Do I have some agency in the world? Does what I do matter? Now, the good news is that although resilience is unevenly distributed across the population, we can build it up at any time. We can change. We can change our personalities. Not just that, but other things like curiosity and conscientiousness and compassion. 
how can we change our personalities? How do we go about that? Well, there's no one route that works for everybody. We all respond to different kinds of things. One big one that works is psychotherapy. Psychotherapy has a, a good history of working for many people. In particular, cognitive behavioral therapy, which offers tools to help you accomplish goals that you and your therapist set together. For some people, it's meditation or yoga or being inspired by other people that you know or that you've read about. Seeing somebody that does something that makes you think, well, I, I want to be more like that. And in some cases, medication, small doses, relatively small doses of anti-anxiety drugs or anti-depression drugs can help to build a number of traits like resilience and compassion and curiosity. And so which personality traits put us in the best position to thrive later in life? Well, the one personality trait that comes up over and over again as being the leading predictor of how we will fare at any age is conscientiousness. Now, this is a cluster of traits that revolve around things like uh, dependability and reliability, finishing what you start, uh, following rules, doing what you'll say you'll do. And, you know, conscientious kids don't cross against the light. So they're less likely to get hit by a truck. And uh, conscientious adults follow at least a modicum of rules and are less likely to end up in prison. Both of those things, getting hit by a truck and ending up in prison, are bad for your health. So is being conscientious is a large part of why that's so valuable for older ages, simply the fact that it gets you to older age? It's that. And then when you're older, uh, if you're conscientious, you've probably developed some healthy lifestyle practices relating to basically moderation, avoiding the kinds of extreme behaviors that might put you at risk, being prudent. Climbing Everest is great when you're 40, probably not such a good idea when you're 85, although people do if they're properly trained and they've checked with a doctor, more power to them. Older people tend to ha who are conscientious tend to have a doctor. They go see the doctor when something's wrong and because they're conscientious, they do what the doctor tells them to do. They actually take the medication when they're supposed to. It's, it's, it, you know, you can't take these things for granted. Doctors are telling me all the time about non-compliant patients, and that's mm. a problem. Uh, what other personality factors can put you in good stead in later life? One of them is curiosity, and uh, related to that is openness to new experience. Because both of those qualities are neuroprotective. They build up new pathways in the brain. It's a myth that we stop growing new neurons and stop making new neural connections when we get older. We do that until the day we die. And learning new things is one of the best things you can do to keep your brain active and healthy. It's really a use it or lose it thing. And although you can't put off getting Alzheimer's, you, there's no cure for it, there's nothing you can do that'll prevent you from getting it, what you can put off is showing the symptoms of it. If you've got these pathways energized and activated and you're learning new things, you build up what we call cognitive reserve. And you could live with Alzheimer's for years and not know it. And no one would know it. This is sort of what happened with the American musician Glenn Campbell. Do you know him there in Australia? I don't know him, but others may well. Glenn Campbell was one of the great guitarists of all time. He had his own television show. He had a number of hit songs, including Rhinestone Cowboy and By the Time I Get to Phoenix, Galveston. He developed Alzheimer's and continued touring. And he got to the point where he didn't know where he was or what year it was. He was quite disoriented. But man, he, he was still one of the best guitar players on the planet. He was able to do that because he had... it's important to meet younger people. You know, we have a, a statesman here named George Schultz, who was Secretary of State in the Reagan administration. 
He's 99 now, and he told me that most of his friends have died, but he's made an effort to meet new people and stay socially active. What you and I are doing right now, having a conversation with somebody who you don't know, Mm -hmm. is about the most complex activity we know of for the brain. And doing that when you're older is vital. That's interesting, but I'm curious, how much is personality a product of socioeconomic circumstances that we find ourselves born into? Well, the, the three big determinants of any personality trait, there, there are thousands of ways we humans differ from one another. The big determinants are genetics, culture, and then what developmental psychologists call opportunity or chance. And if you have a propensity for being afraid of spiders and you live in a place where there aren't spiders, that'll never come out. If, <laughs> if you have a propensity to be curious and you're in an environment where people support that curiosity, teachers and parents, you know, it'll be nurtured and, and it'll increase. It's hard to put too fine a point on the role of culture. Culture exists in the countries we grow up in, the religions we grow up in, the families we grow up in. There are family cultures, community cultures, having to do with how, what, how would you respond to seeing somebody lying in the street who seemed to need help? Big cultural differences. In a large city like New York, people tend to ignore uh, others in that situation. In a rural area or many suburban areas, in a collectivist culture, it would be unthinkable to let a person lie there. about memory and your chapter on memory is subtitled the myth of failing memory and I'm wondering what is the myth of failing memory does that mean we don't lose our memory as we age well some of us do it's a marker of Alzheimer's Uh, but Alzheimer's is rarer than you think and if you build up cognitive reserve you can mask the symptoms of it but the big message is that although our neural processes slow down due to something called demyelination which is just a fancy name for the, the insulation around the wires of your brain, around the neurons that are transmitting electrical impulses. That insulation uh, thins out, gets more difficult to replace it, and it, it causes a, a generalized slowing down. With every decade after 40, we find ourselves struggling to find words or names, but we do get them eventually, uh, which tells a memory theorist like me that your memory is intact, It's just that the pathway to it is disrupted. And the other factor is that the way we test memory in older adults is uniquely stressful on them. We typically have older adults come to a laboratory at a university, a place they've never been to before. Um, They've got to navigate a maze of different buildings and they've got to find the right elevator and they're meeting with somebody in a white lab coat who's a lot younger than them who they know is there to evaluate them. The whole thing is very stressful. And when my colleague Sonia Lupien actually tested their stress hormone, cortisol, she found their cortisol levels were through the roof, equivalent to having just heard a gunshot, you know, or (laughs) or been in a car accident. If she created a situation where they were not stressed, they performed as well as 20-year-olds. It was a real radical rewriting of the memory literature. So how did she redesign those tests to make them less stressful? Well, this was really ingenious on her part. So she had the older adults come in to the laboratory at the university ahead of the actual memory test. So, you know, by the time they come for the memory test, they've already been there. They, they know where to park. You know, she sends a little map, here's where you park, or if you want to take public transportation, this is the bus or subway you take. She had an assistant meet them either in the parking lot or in the lobby of the building. And the assistant, by the way, was 75-year-old Betsy. You know, this, this kindly gray-haired old woman I don't mean old, older woman. <laughs> yep. uh, so Betsy meets them and brings them to the lab. And the lab is kind of done up in a living room kind of a decor with a couch. And Betsy offers them some coffee. And then they get to know Betsy. And, you know, we come back a week later and it's no big thing. And then for the testing, Betsy will sit down with them over coffee and, and show them a photo album. And Betsy will say, look at this. Um, 
This is Laura. She has a cat. Laura's a friend of mine. And then, uh, oh, here is Stan. Stan, uh, 65 years old. He has a new girlfriend named Abigail. You know, she goes through these pictures unbeknownst to the subjects. These are the memory tests. And she asks some questions about the people later, like who, who had the cat? Who's got the new girlfriend? What's the new girlfriend's name? And, you know, by golly, they remembered. You mentioned we do overall sort of slow down a bit up from age 40 and every decade from there. But what we lack in speed, we make up in other attributes, like the ability to recognize patterns. Why is that significant? Well, pattern matching is important in a number of professions, but it's also important in our private lives. Uh, Pattern matching is the ability to see in what might appear to be disparate events, the common features. In the professions, a classic example of pattern matching is radiology. Uh, radiologists have to look at these blobs on a, a, a picture and figure out you know, whether it's a break in a bone or whether it's cancer. And the more of these you've seen, the better you are at it. If you are going in to have an x-ray and they're, they're testing you for cancer, you want the 75-year-old radiologist looking at it, not the 35-year-old. Because the 75-year-old has seen so many more cases, they're better at pattern matching and they're better at predicting outcomes. And so that ability to recognize patterns and that getting better over the decades, is that essentially just because of an accumulation of experiences? It's exactly that, and it's very hard to rush experience. It is true, however, that our neuroplasticity, that's our brain's ability to change and learn new tasks, weakens as we age. But that actually starts happening much earlier than you might think. It starts slowing down at 12. The primary mission of the brain between birth and age 12 is to form as many new connections as possible based on experience. And after that, the primary mission of the brain is to prune out the unneeded connections. doesn't mean you don't learn anything, but the learning takes on a different qualitative aspect. So if you try to learn a foreign language after the age of 12, it's pretty much guaranteed you're going to speak it with a, a, an accent. You, some people push that out to 18. Some people who are really good at language and work really hard can acquire languages later. But, you know, like anything, this is a bell curve. Most people are going to not do well. Same thing with learning a musical instrument. I didn't start playing guitar until I was 20, although I'd played musical instruments since I was four. And I worked with Carlos Santana in the studio some years ago. And when he heard me play guitar, he knew that I was primarily a sax player. And he said, Dan, you play a guitar with an accent. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, you know, he heard that I didn't start till I was 20. You write about perception, abstract thinking. Can you explain some of those? Well, um, older adults are better at solving practical problems. Again, this is based on experience. A practical problem might be, what would you do if you uh, lost your wallet and your cell phone? You know, how would you get home or how would you negotiate where you are? What if your car broke down on on an abandoned road? What kinds of things might you do? Older adults have access to greater problem solving in those domains. Not all of them, most of them as a statistical trend. And as we talked about at the top of the hour, because they experience more compassion and empathy, more tolerance, older adults tend to be better at solving problems that involve other people. So as a rule, again, we can all think of exceptions, leaders of state who are older might be better at the negotiating table in terms of negotiating treaties because they can see the other person's perspective better. Unless you're coming from a real imbalance of power where you just don't care whether the other person gets what they want, a healthy, just negotiation requires some compromise. And just going back to that, that you mentioned about compassion and older adults being more compassionate, why does the brain become more compassionate with older age? And I wonder this because I think it's easy to think about examples of leaders around the world who are in older age and would be, you know, classified as strong men, not particularly compassionate. 
Well, this is a great question. Uh, I've done a hundred interviews about the book, and nobody's asked me this before. So, uh, the the amygdala tends to shrink. That's the fear center. So we're less likely to be reactive and to uh, react out of fear. Um, soothing, tranquilizing hormones are more easy for us to and more common for us to produce, such as prolactin, the same hormone that's released when mothers nurse their infants in both the mother and the infant. We can suffer from some loss of serotonin, but many older adults are being treated for that with micro doses or subclinical doses of antidepressants. And neurostructurally, because we're accessing more positive emotions due to gratitude and positivity bias, and we're accessing fewer negative memories, that positivity bias makes us want to learn more about other people and to make connections to them. Now, there are a lot of older autocrats and dictators and strong men, strong women. Being a, a dictator doesn't favor one sex over the other. I'm thinking of Imelda Marcos and others mm. who were troublesome. I, I think that um, I can't do an armchair diagnosis of what their brains were like, sure. but we do know that power corrupts and it corrupts ideals. It tends to bring around sycophants who just tell you what you want to hear, either because they're afraid of you or because they, they want you to share your power with them. Some people become leaders not because they want what's best for the people they lead, but because they want what's best for them. And they've learned a variety of tricks to fool people into thinking they can trust them. But what you really want... workers of old age is increasing aches and pains. But there is some good news on that front. Well, chronic pain is a marker of aging. and But at some point, if you can get through it, pain actually seems to subside around age 85 for many people. We don't know why that is. Some of it is the, <laughs> the decay of nerve endings and sensory pain perception. And some of it's the slowing down in neural signaling. But there are other factors we can't account for. But chronic pain is among the chief causes of lost time from work. It's a big hit on the economy. But we have discovered that one of the best ways to get rid of pain is to exercise. It can be very unpleasant to do it. But if you can steal up and do it, it's a good therapy against pains. And yeah, if you can get through early 80s, a lot of those chronic pains seem to disappear. And interestingly, we don't all experience pain the same way. It's actually influenced by cultural, environmental, and other factors. That's huge. Uh, it's, it's well known. This is so politically incorrect. But um, it's well known in emergency rooms that you know, you, what will often happen if you go into an emergency room is they'll give you a pain scale. It's actually a pain scale developed at McGill. Uh, and the pain questionnaire asks you to uh, describe the pain in certain ways. Is it throbbing? Is it dull? Is it pointed? And, and typically you have to rate your discomfort on a scale of, of 1 to 10, where 1 is no pain and 10 is the worst pain imaginable. It's well known that members of certain cultures if they present in the emergency room and they say eight or nine, you can let them sit there for a couple hours because it's part of their culture to complain <laughs> vociferously and vocally. But there are members of other cultures who are stoic. And if they walk into the emergency room and they tell you a pain is three, where 10 is the worst imaginable, the doctors know they have to prep the operating room immediately. <laughs> right, okay. We won't name names, but that's really interesting because I do find in my own family there is a sense of fatalism sometimes when, when things happen or things go wrong. It's God's will or whatever it is. And I wonder if that's kind of how it plays out with pain. People, you know, have some fatalism about it versus stoicism. Actually, yeah, absolutely. This comes down to that cultural thing, family culture, religious culture, national culture, uh, collectivist cultures like Japan and India. People you know, tend not to complain. Canada is, is more collectivist in that regard than the U.S. Uh, certainly, U.S. people are very pushy. <laughs> when I was in Montreal, I went to the, the Jewish General Hospital for a blood test and, you know, we took a little number like at a delicatessen counter for when they would call us. And 
the place was a cacophony of uh, older Jewish people. Uh, I'm Jewish myself. I, I, I don't mean to malign uh, an entire culture, but I mean, it's, it's kind of well known in Jewish culture that this is the way it would play out in the Jewish general in the, the blood draw room. All kinds of people were going up to the nurse and saying, "I gotta get ahead in the line. Uh, I've got to get home. My my children are waiting for me. Can you can you put me before this other person? He's not so sick. Look at him. He's not so sick. I should go ahead of him." And, uh, and then just a week later, a different doctor wanted me to get a blood test for something else. I wasn't sick. It was just normal routine stuff. But he sent me to the Catholic hospital, and there, all the older Italian Catholics. Uh, were just sitting quietly waiting their turn. Nobody was complaining. Uh, it was a completely different experience. You also write uh, that, you know, there are coping strategies for pain and, and people in enriched environments experience less pain. So can hobbies and yoga and socializing actually help us cope with pain? Yeah, uh, distraction is one of the best cures for pain. We know this from soldiers who were wounded in battle that, you know, they're struggling to get out of the, the line of fire or pull a friend out of the line of fire. They don't feel the pain for hours or days later. Part of it's adrenaline. Part of it's just that your brain is distracted and it is a, a case of mind over matter. So in an enriched environment, you know, if hospitals had more access to nature, just being able to look out the window at the birds and the squirrels and the trees and a babbling brook, that can relieve a lot of pain. It's, it's extraordinary. I believe you're 62. I'm curious, how do you feel in terms of your mental sharpness and cognitive abilities now compared to, say, your 32-year-old self? Well, I'm probably not the best judge because if I have any impairment, maybe my ability to <laughs> self-judge is impaired. But I find that I'm quicker at pulling out findings from scientific discoveries. I'm quicker at writing books and articles. I don't know that I'm as productive. I used to get in a good 16-hour day where I didn't stop. Wow. These days, I wouldn't say I do that, but I think it's a case of compensatory mechanisms. I'm faster at some things, slower at others. And I guess, what are your key takeaways then for aging well? Uh, try to develop resilience and conscientiousness. Stay open to new experiences and curious. Keep your social circle active. Meet new people. If you're on lockdown, like we are here in California, meet new people or revive some friendships through Skype or FaceTime or what have you. And um, follow good sleep hygiene. Don't get sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. 